Hey everyone, and welcome back to Music Appreciation. Today we are looking at chapter 25, um, the symphony number 40 by Mozart. Returning again to our music history timeline, we have so far covered the Middle Ages, Renaissance, and Baroque era, so today we're beginning our look at the Classical era, which is a relatively short period of time that spans about uh, the 1750 up to the 19th century, so just about 50 or so years. Uh, now this term is confusing because, of course, we talk about classical music in a more general sense, uh, referring to kind of anything that might be included under these time periods, um, but in fact, uh, the classical era really spans um, just this one short time period, so um, you can kind of use it interchangeably just to make things confusing. Um, so the classical era, uh, this refers to um, classical antiquity, so ancient Greece and Rome, um, and we brought them up when we were talking about the Renaissance back here um, as the rebirth of um, or renewal and in interest of ancient Greek and Roman texts. Um, about philosophy, the natural world, religion, government, etc. Um, and so during this classical era, um, all of these, uh, this revival in ideas is still very popular um, and prominent throughout the arts. Um, and so composers from this time period kind of tried to emulate these styles in terms of clarity, order, and intellectualism. Um, and much of this music has kind of continued on into the modern age as being sort of the um, epitome of classical music. So that's why we call it the classical era. Um, and if you think about the word classic in general, it kind of means something that sets a standard. So thinking about classic rock or classic cars, um, same thing applies here. Uh, probably the most famous name associated with the classical era um, would be the composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart who was an Austrian composer who lived from 1756 to 1791. So um, he died pretty early, sadly, a short life, but did so much um, in those few years. Um, he worked for the most part of his life as a court composer, and I also mentioned on Wednesday that Bach, the Baroque composer, was a court composer as well. Um, so he worked in palaces for royal patrons, kind of at their behest, writing music, uh, that would be performed throughout the household for entertainment purposes. Um, Mozart famously was very unhappy with that situation, and he was constantly being fired and moving around to different courts. Um, he kind of felt that that was a, it stifled his creativity, um, but uh, I guess that says a lot about the fact that his music has survived still today. Um, so he wrote a, a wide variety of styles of music. He's especially famous for operas as well. We'll look at one of those next week. Um, but today we're looking at his 40th symphony, and he wrote 41 symphonies overall, which is pretty impressive because these are very large-scale works. Um, so to write 41 of them in such a short time span in his life is pretty impressive. Um, he was famous as a child prodigy from a very young age. So here's a painting of... of um, young Mozart right here at the harpsichord, um, and this is his father Leopold. His father was also a famous musician. He was known as a violinist, worked in the courts as well. Um, so like Bach, uh, Mozart came from a very musical family, and uh, his sister, who's a couple years older than him, Nanerl, was also a very talented um, child prodigy, a performer and composer. Um, but during this time period, it was considered inappropriate for young women to be performing publicly, to be making music, um, so she had to end her musical career quite early. But when they were both children, as we can see here, they traveled around Europe extensively, performed for all of the most important figures, um, and were quite famous from a young age. So kind of a fascinating story there. And so let's look at the genre of the symphony and we're going to be listening to the 40th symphony by Mozart today. Um, so the symphony, as I mentioned, is a large-scale work for orchestra. So large-scale in the sense that it requires a lot of performers, large personnel for the entire orchestra. Um, today orchestras can have up to about 100 people, uh, probably would have been a smaller group during Mozart's time, but still a large group of performers. Um, and it also tends to be quite lengthy as well. So symphonies probably average from about 30 minutes to an hour long. So quite a bit of music. So large scale, 
Um, they're divided up into four movements or internal sections. And we talked about movements um, as well when we looked at the Vivaldi Violin Concerto, Winter. Um, and this is an instrumental genre, meaning only instruments, no singing. And of course, by this time, instrumental music has become quite popular when we didn't see it um, so much in the earlier time periods. And so here's kind of a diagram of what the symphony orchestra looks like if you were to go see one perform today. And there are plenty of orchestras here in Athens you could go see. Um, you would see this similar setup. So uh, here in the center we have the conductor usually standing on a podium and he has a baton that he leads the orchestra with or he or she leads the orchestra with. Um, and then we've got sort of like a half moon shape here. So this first section over here to his left um, are going to be the violins. Kind of in the center, this center piece would be the violas, which are slightly lower pitched than the violin, but look very similar. And then to the conductor's right, this final slice in the pie would be our cellos. Um, and then here in the back, we also have another layer. We've got um, the basses behind the cellos. And then uh, the brass section over here, so trombones, French horns, tubas, uh, instruments like that. Um, down here in the center, behind the violas, we have the winds, so think of like flutes, oboes, um, clarinets. Over here to the left, we've got the percussion, so all of our drums and xylophones and gongs and timpani. Um, and then if you've got a harp, for example, that might be thrown in back here behind the violins. So similar setup still today. Now the thing where I'm particularly interested in in our discussion about this symphony today is form out of all of our eight elements of music here. Um, and music from the classical era, 1752 to about 1800, tends to follow form pretty religiously. Um, so we can think of the form of a symphony here as being analogous to a dramatic work, like a movie or a novel or a play. So um, most, most plays, for example, are set up in kind of three acts. So the first act is where we meet all of our main characters and the supporting characters, get to know who they are. Um, then the middle of it, Act 2, um, is where we see these characters interacting. We witness their conflicts. So examples of like this of this might be um, characters falling in love or fighting or searching for something. Um, so we get a sense of sort of tension, this buildup. Um, and then the third act, the very end, is where we get a resolution of this conflict, um, whatever that might be. So you can think of that as being similar, analogous to the form of a symphony here. And this is what we call sonata form. So we have three similar sections, the exposition, development, and recapitulation. Um, so exposition is a word that we introduced uh, on Wednesday in our discussion about the Bach fugue. Um, so the exposition is where you are exposed to the main themes, main melodies. So that's um, analogous to meeting our main characters here. Um, the development is where we are witnessing our themes interacting, developing, changing, um, and we're feeling a uh, tension being built up. We're introducing new ideas, so similar to the conflicts that you might witness in Act 2 here. Um, and then the recapitulation, this is where we recap our main ideas and themes. So we return back home to what's familiar to us, to our main themes, um, and we resolve any conflict that built up during the development section. So Mozart's uh, Symphony Number no. 40 has a very memorable theme. And so what I'm going to do next is play through um, this main theme from the exposition, show you how it develops throughout the development section, where we get new kind of tension building up, and how we return back to the recapitulation. So um, laid out here is the musical notation for this opening theme in the exposition. Um, so I'll play a little bit of this for you, get it in your ear. So it moves pretty quickly, it has sort of this feel that it's pushing forward, ahead, sort of urgently. Um, when you hear it performed with the orchestra, you'll get a better sense of that. Uh, but it's in a minor key, so it has a slightly dark feel. 
and I circled these first three notes here in red um, and that's really the main heart of this theme is the short short long short short long short short long so I'll play that again that's what we're gonna be listening for that's the soul of this piece or those three north three notes short short long short short long so uh, we'll be introduced to that in the beginning and then we're gonna reach the second act or the development section um, and we're gonna hear this theme return once again it pervades the entire work um, but in the development section it's going to sound slightly strange a little bit different a little bit distorted so um, with that in your ear, if this is the original theme. Now, this is what happens to it during the development. It turns a little bit strange. And so on and so forth. So we've got that same core of the short, short, long, short, short, long, but this time it's in a different key and he kind of twists it at the ends of phrases. For example, right here, those last two notes right there sound kind of out of place, sort of wrong. Um, and so we're building up tension and conflict here. And he continues on with this later on through the development section further transforming that first theme. Again, we're listening for the core of the short, short, long, short, short, long. And in this section, he kind of builds it up. We inch upwards slowly, um, kind of modulating to weird keys. Um, it feels a little bit uncomfortable and it never quite leads where we expect it to go. So I'll play a section of this here. there you could hear the same core there of that main exposition theme but he's still playing around with it twisting twisting it around and messing with your expectations um, so now we've built up all of that conflict so where do we return now we have to get back to the recapitulation or our third act here um, and this is where we resolve all of that tension so um, now he's going to repeat that exact same theme from the first X or from the X exposition and so this should sound familiar and uh, kind of like you're back at home. And that pretty much ends the piece there. Um, we've now been through our introduction, development, and returned back home to our main characters and our resolution. Um, so now next I would like to actually watch a performance of this here, the small chamber orchestra. Um, so it's a smaller group, but we can still see we've got our conductor here, violins to the, his left, violas in front, and then um, various winds and bass in the back here.
entering the development section. This is going to take that main theme and start kind of transforming it and messing around with it a little bit. And now we're back at the recapitulation, the main theme from the exposition. And that ends the first movement of Mozart Symphony Number no. 40. And so I, I encourage you to listen to it again once more um, and try to follow along with the changing developments of the main theme from the exposition. Um, and I hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>